everyone to our last virtual book party of 2021. Um, we have several librarians here to share some favorites from this year. Um, we will be sending you a list right after this event with links in the catalog to all the books so you don't have to frantically write down all the authors and titles. And um, I did want to remind you that we will be having um, a New Year New Books events in January and we will have a virtual event and an in-person event. And so if those are on the website already, and if you just search on events for new year, new books, you will find both of those. So you can choose between virtual or in-person. Um, the in-person one will feature children, picture books, children's books, teen books, and adult books in, in order. So you can come to whichever part is of interest to you. Um, so first, we're going to really quick introduce ourselves. Most of you are familiar with our format. We'll be talking very quickly about one of our favorite books going around. My name's Allison Cochran. I'm an adult advisory librarian. And Anna, you're up next. My name is Anna, and I'm an adult services librarian. Catherine? Is that how we're doing it? Popcorning. My name is Catherine. I am one of the teen services librarian. So, librarians. <laughs> um, I think Charles is next. I'm Charles. I'm one of the reference librarians, uh, mostly at Southland. Good to see you all. Uh, Kate, you're the only other one I can see. You skipped Chelsea. Chelsea. Yeah, it's hard to see. We can't. Chelsea? Oh, okay, it is my turn. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm one of the reference librarians. And I'm Kate. I'm also one of the reference librarians, and my home branch is Smoky Hill. Thank you, Liz. And my name's Liz Hounts. I am also a new reference librarian, and my home branch is at Sheridan. I believe Marina is next. My name is Marina. I am the Spanish language librarian for Arapaho Libraries, and I think Tegan is next. Uh, I am Tegan. I'm a reference librarian. My home branch is Cobalt. Uh, and I believe we have Ted. Hey, and uh, I'm Ted. I'm one of the youth librarians. We will jump right in. Okay, my first book is Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Gunkle stands for Gay Uncle Patrick. He's a retired sitcom star leading a very quiet life in Palm Springs. When he's called upon to take care of his niece and nephew after his sister-in-law's death. Patrick is still recovering from the loss of his partner, and the kids have just lost their mom. But this book will make you smile and laugh as much as you might cry. It's a story of healing through love, connection, family, and most especially humor. Four Thousand Weeks Time Management for Mortals is written and read by Oliver Berkman, a time management productivity geek, who during the COVID lockdown in his New York City apartment came to grips with time. This nonfiction book is a micro history of time and productivity. Berkman examines humanity's historic relationship to time, then discusses our modern ideas about productivity and the language we use to talk about time. Finally, he offers both philosophical and practical ideas of how to create a meaningful life by embracing finitude, the 4,000 weeks of an average 80-year life. He writes with self-depreciating good humor, provides a refreshing break from the everyday to-do list, and most importantly, gives us the opportunity to take a thoughtful time out during the pandemic reset to recreate our own new normal. This is the perfect read listen for New Year's contemplations. All right, um, I'm trying to time keep and talk. <laughs> um, this one, The Dead in the Dark is a YA book, so it's geared towards teens, but I would say it has a lot of crossover appeal for adult readers as well. It is, as the title and cover imply, a pretty dark story. It's part serial killer story. It's got a bit of ghost hunter TV show element to it, monster horror, and it's really about the things that lurk in dark corners. It follows Logan, who is returning with her two dads to Snakebite, Oregon, their hometown, for the first time since she was a baby. 
her one of her dads has gone back and he is brooding over this um, group of teens who have started going missing and he is made to deal with his dark past. There's lots of really fascinating twists and turns. It is definitely a dark story. I did not see a lot of the twists that were coming and it is so satisfying. My first book is Go Ahead in the Rain, uh, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest by Hanif Abdul-Rakib. It is a nonfiction piece of work. Abdul-Rakib is a poet and critic that writes beautifully about the 90s, especially the early 90s, <clears throat> and all the pop culture incorporating major events and other rap groups that surrounded a tribe called Quest during this time. It is a love letter to, to Fife Dog, Q-Tip, Ali Shaheed Muhammad, and Jerobi White. These are the members of the group, as well as a critique and the career arc of their productions. I, this kind of sent me back to junior high and high school. A lot of um, things that brought memories back. Uh, I recommend this for anybody who's a fan of rap and hip hop and early 90s pop culture. Hey, the Final Girls Support Group by Grady Hendrix. This book explores what happens to the final girls, the last girls standing at the end of a slasher flick, um, and what happens afterwards, like when the credits stop rolling. Lynette is one such final girl and part of the Final Girls Support Group, where the final girls meet every week to try and carry on and provide support and community until one member misses a meeting and shows up dead. This book is scrappy and fast paced and I would recommend it for fans of 80s and 90s slasher flicks. Also, if you enjoyed any of Hendrix's other works, this is definitely up there. Great, The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. Um, this book is an adult historical fiction. Um, it's quickly becoming a modern day classic. Since it came out in June, it's been both long listed for the Booker Prize and it was also picked up by Oprah's book club. So it's been pushed in a lot of uh, spheres. It's the end of the Civil War. Union soldiers are going on horseback from farm to farm, delivering the Emancipation Proclamation. Brothers Prentice and Landry are now free, which practically means very little when you're in the 1860s South with no money and no prospects as black men. The two decide to work as farm hands for the Walker family to earn money with the hopes to reunite with their long lost mother. At the same time, disgraced Confederate soldiers return home, including the Walter's son Caleb, who has been presumed dead after disappearing from the battlefield. With him is fellow Confederate soldier and lover, August, who runs the town with his larger-than-life father. The two continue their rendezvous in the woods, only to be caught one day leading to murder, heartbreak, and fleeing for one's life. Will justice be served when it's a matter of one man's word against another? Think Again is by Adam Grant, an organizational psychologist, and is known for a few TED Talks. He is the author of Originals and Give and Take. In this nonfiction book, he encourages one to change how they think or how to unlearn to relearn. We often hold on to our beliefs and preach them, and any idea that is different than ours, we feel threatened by and get into fight mode. We also tend to surround ourselves with like minded individuals who share those beliefs. Throughout this book, he provides real life investigative examples and encourages others to find the joy of being wrong. If you enjoy learning about how other people tick and would like to have a normal politicized conversation without getting into a heated debate, this book is for you. The Wrong End of the Telescope by Rabi Alamedin. This is an adult, a work of adult fiction. Uh, set on the island of Lesbos, Arab-American doctor Mina Simpson is summoned by one of her longtime friends to serve as a volunteer aiding newly arrived immigrants who are arriving on shore after desperate voyages. So, of course, she packs up, leaves her wife, and flies out to the Greek islands. 
In, the, in a lull in the emergency tempo of island life, Nina finds herself connecting with a refugee that reminds her of her past life. This includes the story of how her own family left Syria, as well as her gender transition and how that was received by her family and friends. This is a poignant story and a unique perspective on the current state of the world. Yeah, so this is Rest Dogs, and it is a juvenile book, but I think it has a lot of um, broad appeal. It's about a girl, it's told in verse, and it's about a girl named Molly, and who's visiting her grandparents on a Wabanaki reservation right when COVID hits. Now, as everyone's going into lockdown, everyone's starting to panic, nobody really knows what's happening, Molly and looks at her window one day and sees a, this gigantic black dog sitting in her driveway. She doesn't really know what to make of it until her grandmother tells her that it's a rest dog, it has its own way of doing things, and if it wants to be hers, it'll let her know. Molly and her grandparents spend the next few weeks trying to navigate loneliness, isolation, and telling family, excuse me, family stories, folk tales, and gossip from around the reservation. Um, one of the things that this does extremely well is captures exactly how terrifying it was the first few weeks uh, when COVID was uh, really spreading. And it's also really funny and really touching in a lot of places. So that is Rest Dogs. Tokyo Ever After by Miko Jean is a teen book recommended for ages 12 and up. Uh, it is also a Reese Witherspoon YA book club pick. Uh, so it is about Izumi, who is a Japanese American teen who has never known her father's identity. One day she finds a clue in her mother's room, and when confronted, her mother reveals that Izumi's father is the crown prince of Japan. She gives Izumi a way to contact him, and then Izumi's world spirals into chaos. She is invited to Japan to meet her family and learn how to be a proper Japanese princess. Izumi has always worried she was not American enough when at home, and now she wonders if she's Japanese enough in her new role. And it doesn't help that her bodyguard becomes more than he first seemed to her. This is a fun story about discovering what it means to be yourself and to find where you fit in the world. Okay, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. This is another Oprah book club pick. This is both historical fiction and somewhat contemporary. It's an ambitious saga that is the, like tries to tell the entire story of African-American history through the stories of one family. The main character is Ailey, a young girl who's growing up in the 1980s and 90s. And we see how the experience of her ancestors have shaped her story. And those ancestors were indigenous, enslaved Blacks, slave owners, and we follow multiple family strands and generations in this story that is Ailey's story and America's story as well. It's long, it's complicated, but so worth the effort. Just an amazing book. All In, an autobiography is written and read by Billie Jean King, an amazing sports hero, the world's number one ranked tennis player for years, and the first female athlete to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her world-changing accomplishments, not tennis, as she rightly notes. King was and still is an activist and organizer for women's rights, especially equal pay for equal work, LGBTQ plus rights, racial equality, and social equity. Even if you don't know much about tennis, this book is eye-opening regarding inequality in sports and the tumult in the world during her lifetime. She was born in 1943 into a low-income family in California and with grit and talent from a young age traveled the state, country, and eventually the world playing tennis. Meanwhile, experiencing the Vietnam War, Haight-Ashbury, apartheid, civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the Cold War, assassinations of the 60s, the space race, and finally Title IX. King writes and narrates with passion and humor, tells many stories, including her behind the scenes version of Battle of the Sexes tennis match. If you enjoy insightful biographies of people who lived action packed lives on the world stage, this is a great read listen. I 
uh, didn't unmute, sorry. <laughs> Blackbirds in the sky. Um, the story and legacy of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre is technically young adult nonfiction, but I think it should be recommended reading at the very least for anyone of any age. Um, Brandy Colbert does a fantastic job of kind of bringing to light this event that on the 100th anniversary this year in observance that has all but been erased from history for the most part. She talks with people who live there in Tulsa and very close by who had never heard of the race massacre until it started to come on to the centennial anniversary. Um, so on June 1st, 1921, in a matter of hours, the Black Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma was razed to the ground. 35 blocks were completely destroyed and hundreds were killed. Um, Colbert outlines the events that led up to the massacre and examines how and why it is so unknown today, um, alternating between quotes from the survivors and the narrative story of the elevator operator and the young black man who um, met one another and they believe is what set off the riot that started with the massacre. Um, the narrative is immersive and will leave you searching for more. I'm a pretty decent home cook, so I love a good uh, cookbook. This is Cook This Book by Molly Baz. Molly is formerly of Bon Appetit Test Kitchen fame and has moved on to freelance work. This is a great and easily approachable cookbook. <clears throat> and this is kind of one of my wheelhouse type cookbooks, you know, stuff you don't have to go scavenging for at uh, different types of grocery stores. Most of the ingredients can be easily found in most grocery stores and have interesting twists on regularly made dishes. Cabbage stew with sausage, uh, cabbage stew with sausage, chorizo and chickpea carbonara, and her famous, she just calls it K sal, which is essentially a Caesar salad, um, are some of the more interesting recipes. Uh, most recipes also include QR codes because we've all learned how to use QR codes in the last two years. Uh, to get quick tips and simple cooking techniques. They link to her videos on her website. Highly recommend one of the best cookbooks of 2021. The secret to superhuman strength. Yay! This is Alison Bechtel's most recent autobiographical graphic novel. Uh, this book explores her lifelong fascination with fitness crazes. Bechtel is delightful with her tragic comic approach to storytelling and highly relatable in her sampling of fitness trends and outdoor activities. And she is at once playful and in constant odds with her slowly aging body and her philosophical exploration of what it means to have superhuman strength through our very shared and human interdependence. I would definitely recommend this for fans of Bechtel's prior works, including Fun Home and Dykes to Watch Out For. The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. Have you ever read a book narrated by a book? Our hardcover friend narrates the story of Benny, a young teenage boy who is struggling through the recent loss of his father. His mother, who is quickly becoming a hoarder, is doing her best as a recent widow to provide for her and Benny, but teenage boys are just hard to get. Plus, she just can't quite understand that really the scissors were speaking Chinese. The voices started the day of his father's funeral. Benny swears he could hear his dad just before they shoved his cardboard coffin into the crematorium. Now the windows, the clock, the scissors, they just won't shut up. With plenty of his mother's things around, there's no shortages of voices yelling, crying, whining. His only refuge is the public library, where the objects have learned to keep their voices down. Ruth Ozeki weaves a smart and vibrant story of grief, family relationships, and mental health that you'll pick up and won't be able to put down. If you love old Victorian novels mixed with a little bit of magic and mischief, why not give the Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry a try? Deli, a fire gutter witch, is just trying to make ends meet, help her ma'am get off a drug habit, and secure a stable employment. 
To start an earning income, she joins the quest with other magical misfits as a bardi guard to protect a wealthy lady on her way to getting married. Trouble is afoot when the job goes wrong and Deli must chase after another lead. At the same time, trying to control her destructive firepower. With just a dash of Dungeons and Dragons, this adventure-packed thriller mystery is excellent for anyone with a dark sense of humor and just has a smidge of queer romance. It is a perfect for a cozy read for anyone who just feels like they're surviving through life and need an uplifting story. The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century by Amiya Srinivasan. This is another adult nonfiction title. And from the provocative title of the book, Srinivasan makes clear that she's pushing for a broader political and philosophical discussion about sex and the role of feminism. Having read many books on this topic already, I, re I read her essays with interest, enjoying her willingness to dig into the political promise or failed political promise of feminism. I recommend this nonfiction collection, whether you are newly aware of these ideas or have been thinking about them for a while. Srinivasan writes in an engaging, approachable style, bringing a fresh perspective to even the most loaded topics. Yeah, so this is Fangs, and if you're looking for a good dose of escapism, this would definitely be a great one to pick up. Uh, this is an adult graphic novel, although it's not really so much a graphic novel as a collection of um, collection of one-off comics um, from Sarah Anderson, who you might recognize from her uh, wildly uh, popular Sarah Scribbles comics. It's about a vampire named Elsie and a werewolf named Jimmy, who, against all odds, fall madly in love and decide to build a life with each other in spite of their naturally extremely wild and sometimes in uh, sometimes uh, vast differences. Um, this one's a little tricky to book talk because there's not really there's not really much of a thread in it, but if you are looking for something that is just delightful and kind of oddly creepy but also wildly charming, this would definitely be a great one to pick up. So that is Fangs. If the Shoe Fits by Julie Murphy is an adult romance. It is a modern Cinderella retelling with a few twists. The first of them is that Cindy actually gets along with her stepfamily, and that really helps drive the plot. Cindy's stepmother runs a TV game show a la The Bachelor. When some contestants drop out, she finally agrees to allow her daughters on the show after they've been asking for years. She does not want Cindy to join because bigger girls and internet trolls are not a good mix. Cindy finally convinces her to let her on the show so she can gain some exposure for her fashion expertise and hopefully gain a, gain a job in the fashion industry. Little does Cindy know that Prince Charming is the cute guy she shared a plane ride home with and had a serious connection. Cindy has to discover if choosing a wonderful job offer in fashion or choosing the guy means having to give up on one or the other. This book is laugh out loud funny. The banter was some of my favorite moments. This is also a really good book for positive fat representation. Cindy is a bigger girl, but she does not spend the whole book worrying about a diet or feeling woe is me about her size. She accepts herself as she is and loves to live her life. Okay, so you get two books here because one of my favorite, favorite books of this year was The Man Who Died Twice by Richard Osman. And one of my favorites last year was the first book in the series, The Thursday Murder Club. And you should start with The Thursday Murder Club. You'll join the residents of Cooper Chase Retirement Home as they go from discussing um, crime cases in their Thursday murder club and how they might go about solving them to actually solving crimes when murders start happening at the retirement homes. Richard Osman is a comedian um, and television host in Great Britain, and it shows in his writing, I snorted out loud listening to both of these audiobooks, and I hope he goes on to write many more great mystery series. Water, a biography, is written and read by Giulio Baccaletti, PhD. He's a scientist and expert on natural resource security and environmental sustainability. In this nonfiction microhistory, he explains humanity's relationship with water in its many forms, 
globally from prehistory to the present. He explains water infrastructure, which influences many things, agriculture, law, politics, culture, religion, borders, wars, transportation, trade, economics, climate, and ecosystems. He begins with the Three Gorges Dam in China and circles back to it in the final pages. In between, he tells amazing stories about things and places you may not have ever thought about. He ends with climate change, shifting monsoons, floods, droughts, and food security. If you like learning new things and enjoy nonfiction authors whose books tell expansive global stories such as Simon Winchester, Bill Bryson, Mark Kurlansky, and Michael Pollan, then this informative read listen is for you. A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger what is another young adult novel. It was long listed for the young people's uh, list for the National Book Award and definitely deserved that nomination. It is a bit of a slow unwinding story that I definitely recommend savoring. Um, it follows Nina, who is a lip and Apache girl living in our world, who is trying to unravel the mystery of her grandmothers and the um, kind of dying language of her people that she's trying to translate. And it alternates chapters with Ollie, who is a cottonmouth snake kid who lives in an alternate dimension and is trying to come into our world to save his best friend's species from extinction, a rare frog type. Um, and I recommend listening to the audiobook for this one because Little Badger does a wonderful job of drawing on the traditional Lip and Apache storytelling style, um, which is oral history. And so the audiobook really brings that technique to life in a beautiful way. My last book is Born, Reborn in the USA by Roger Bennett, <clears throat> uh, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home. Raj, as he's affectionately known of Men in Blazers fame, penned this novel after becoming an American citizen. Take a look at why other countries, even England, look to America as a shining beacon of hope. Bennett looks back upon his childhood through adolescence to find the reasons why he loves America so much and looks past excuse me, and looks past the political bickering uh, to the real reasons why America is such a wonderful destination for so many. For anyone tired of the political and DC infighting and wanting to reestablish a love for their country, this was an inspirational and hilarious book, recommended in the audio format where Roger Bennett narrates the book. Sorry, my PowerPoint just disappeared accidentally. That was exciting. <laughs> there we go. Hit the wrong button. <laughs> Things get exciting. And with more excitement, we have a collection of poetry. Uh, Water I Won't Touch by Caleb Ray Kendrilli is a new collection of poetry exploring what it is to exist in our bodies and in this world, both of which have gone through so many physical and emotional changes, especially in these last two years. Um, Kendrilli's poems, um, although unflinching in face of the world we live in, are ultimately hopeful and find joy in having a garden and creating a queer future, finding love and not scorching every meal. So this is a truly celebratory uh, collection of poetry, and I hope that so many people will use this as an entry point to poetry, especially contemporary, uh, because it's not all scary sonnets and unintelligible language. All right, A Place Like Home by Rosamund Pilger. The Perfect Holiday Read. A Place Like Home is a collection of fictional short stories and her, her writing style truly is a place like home. Uh, this is the novel equivalent of like a Hallmark movie we've all been looking for. And it's a wonderful, cozy read uh, for wintertime. There's no dark twist, only short vignettes of returning home to the beautiful English countryside and falling in love. Uh, this is a great book for those who enjoy Downton Abbey, Hallmark movies, and just general cozy reads. 
So pour yourself a cup of hot chocolate and grab your fuzzy blanket because forgotten family members are reuniting and long lost lovers are finding their way back to each other. Have you always wondered what it would take to run a cult? In the atmospherians, this contemporary futuristic fight club, a woman creates a cult with her best friend. Sasha had it all, a fabulous social media presence, a wealthy income, and of course, loses those all in a twist of events. Until her best friend from childhood, Dyson, shows up with an idea, a new way to fix society and make the world safer, AKA, get rid of toxic masculinity. So they gather a small group of men to fix them out in the middle of the Jersey woods. Will they succeed? This book is by Alex McRoy. It is their first novel. They are a non-binary author who has written for The Atlantic, Tin House, and Vice. The writing is explosive, funny, and challenges today's society's obsession with social media and current events. If you are just looking for something truly bizarre and cannot put down, I highly recommend this book. On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Restraint. You may have heard of Nelson because of her boundary-breaking memoir, The Argonauts. In her most recent uh, work, this collection of essays, she takes a different but no less open and vulnerable approach. These essays are her musings on the four topics of art, sex, drugs, and climate change. It's not possible for me to summarize it all here, but suffice to say that the way she uses each topic to discuss the tension between freedom and our duty to care for others has stuck with me. And I have recommended it to all of my friends because I want to keep talking about it. All right, so if you're looking for something that's an odd blend of both hilarious and also utterly devastating, definitely read The Transition Baby. It is about a man named Ames who finds himself having an affair with his boss, and he discovers, unfortunately, that he has, um, that he has, um, or that they will be having a baby shortly. Ames did not know that he could still do that, because Ames, without... Uh, Ames actually is a detransitioned uh, trans woman who used to go by Amy, and had essentially detransitioned and tried to create a new life for himself away from uh, everyone that he had known while transitioning. Now, Ames uh, freaks out when he finds out that his boss is pregnant. He decides that he can't uh, think of himself as a father or as really even a parent without the assistance of his ex-girlfriend, uh, Reese, who he tries to rope in to essentially try to convince his boss to raise this baby with the three of them. This is, um, I've read a lot of reviews that describe this as a comedy of social manners. I don't know why they say that, um, but it is oddly funny and also devastating and terrifying and wonderful. So that is Detransition Baby. A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. This is the fourth book of the Court of Thorns and Roses series, but I don't think you need to have read the first three to enjoy this book. There are some references to earlier events, but the character and story focus shifts for this book. We now follow Nesta Archeron after she has been turned into a fairy and is having a hard time adjusting to her new life and dealing with the trauma of being turned against her will. Cassian, a fairy warrior, is assigned to train Nesta to fight and try to pull her out of a very destructive, depressive spiral. Nesta is also assigned to work in the library, which is staffed by other female fairies who have been brutalized in various ways and have been given the library as a safe haven. Nesta begins to make connections with some of the female fae and through her work with Cassian starts to find the strength within herself. This book was a wonderful representation of how difficult it can be to battle various mental health issues. There are examples of PTSD, anxiety, and depression. It actually brought me to tears a few times. The romance in this book is also quite spicy, so if explicit descriptions are not something you enjoy, it is okay to avoid this one.
Am I introducing the consensus favorites? All right. So there were a few books that we've book talked a couple times this year, and we multiple of us agreed that they were our favorite books of the year. So we're going to run through those fairly quickly. Um, if any of you have been following the Goodreads Choice Awards, Amari and the Knight Brothers was robbed. Rick Riordan didn't need another award. <laughs> He won the children's category, but this one was arguably a better book. It was my favorite middle grade novel of the year. Um, and it is a great choice for anyone who is looking for an inclusive option for themselves or their kiddos um, for Harry Potter fans. Um, it follows Amari, whose brother Quentin has been missing for a while, and she finds a ticking briefcase and message that leads her to a hidden magical world and discovers that she is the keeper of a forbidden magic. Tegan, you want to do Firekeepers? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, yeah, Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully is a teen book recommended ages 14 and up. It's a mystery that deals with drug crime happening within the Ojibwe community. Donis is conscripted to help some undercover FBI agents when it is discovered her friends are suspects in the investigation. The truth ends up being so much worse than Donis could ever have imagined. As someone with mixed parentage, Donis struggles a lot with trying to figure out where she fits in. She's not quite white enough for her mother's family, but not quite Ojibwe enough for her father's community. Helping in the investigation also exacerbates some of those problems for Donis. This is a wonderful book that highlights the issues that many people in the Native American communities face in a careful and loving way, as Angeline Bully is also a member of the Ojibwe tribe. It is also a story of trying to figure out where you fit in the world when you feel like you are straddling two sides of yourself. Straddling two sides of yourself is probably the perfect introduction to Michelle Zahner's Crying in H Mart. This is a, an adult nonfiction memoir. Better known until now for her indie pop band, Japanese Breakfast, Zahner bears her soul in this memoir. Growing up as a Korean American, she had the Asian American experience of being treated as a perpetual foreigner in her own land while not being quite Korean enough outside of it. Family and food are central to the stories from her life that Michelle shares here, and you may find yourself with an appetite alongside your new perspective. If you want to pay homage to the book, you too can go cry or just shop in one of our two Colorado H Mart stores. So Pamela and I have been arguing since early this year about, no, it was my favorite. No, it's my favorite. The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot by Marianne Croner. It's a book that made a lot of us laugh and cry. Lenny and Margot are both in the hospital, but they happen upon an art class where they end up describing their lives through their 100 years between them. Lenny is only 17 and Margot is 83. It's a beautiful cross-generational story with characters that you wish you knew um, and will stay with you a long time. 100 years of Lenny and Margot. Yes, Kristen, many tissues are needed. It, it's true. So, and that is, um, the end of our books for for this year we had a lot more we know you did too thank you so much for listening um we will be sending you the list um of all the books and again thank you all for attending have a good evening